Hi, everybody. I'm Tony Marcolini, a professor and an attorney here in the great state of New Jersey. I'm joined today with my co-hosts, author and attorney John Hartman, and executive chef uh, Camp, Camp David, and White House chef, former White House chef, Marty Mangello. Yay! And we have a very special guest today. Before we get to our intro, let me introduce him. A uh, three-time Super Bowl champion uh, for the uh, New York Giants, San Francisco 49ers, Bart Oates. Hi, Tony. Hi. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. And we're going to go to our intro and be right back with Bart. So we're back with Bart Oates here today. Uh, I tell you, Bart, I was talking beforehand, trying to figure out what to focus on with you. And there's so much life that you've lived. We almost couldn't narrow it down. Um, so I, I think we're going to start back at the beginning, if that's okay. Uh, well, that's okay. Let's go. <laughs> Well, tell me a little bit about, before you got into the NFL, you played, I want to say two years, but you correct me if I'm wrong, um, with the uh, uh, a different football league. Is that true? Is that true? Yes. Now, before coming to the Giants, I played uh, in a uh, league called the USFL. It lasted only three years, uh, 83, 84, 85 were the years. And what was you kind of unique about the twist – that they had was they were playing springtime. So they weren't trying to compete directly oh. with the NFL. We played springtime ball. And New Jer up here in New Jersey, played in the, in the Meadowlands, was called the New Jersey Generals. Um, oh, sure. Trump I, the team. And I was playing in Philadelphia for a team called the Philadelphia Stars. And so it was owned by a real estate developer, Miles Tannenbaum. And um, that was my first experience. I remember I played my senior year. I wasn't intended. I wasn't kind of, I wasn't slotted to be a high draft choice or even if I was going to get drafted, it was going to be, you know, eighth, seventh, eighth round or so. And so, um, cause I was playing at a smaller school. We didn't get a lot of attention. I played at Brigham Young University. And then, um, so I, I decided, uh, the time I was, I really didn't have aspirations or I didn't, wasn't really uh, that highly recruited from, a, you know, into the professional ranks. And so um, I was, I figured out, you know, I was uh, going to wind up going to school. And um, so I knew I wanted to go to law school after I finished my accounting degree. And so this team came along, offered me a guaranteed three-year contract, personally guaranteed by the owner. And so, uh, I'm thinking it was for me at the time, 1983, it was a, a three year, $310,000 total for in total, a contract. Wow. So on today's standards, not real big, but for me, a kid that was uh, going to have to pay his way through uh, law school, I'm saying Absolutely. this will pay my, I come out of law school with no debt. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm saying this, this is absolutely the way. So I took the contract and played all three years in the USFL. And how did you get lured over to the NFL? Well, the, the USFL stopped after 85. And so they had, um, they ceased operations. Uh, it was a great, I, we, I had a great time. I would have, if the league had survived, I would have stayed in the, in the USFL and, and, to me, I'm an offensive lineman, so if I get attention, it doesn't matter anyway. I don't like attention, so no attention is, is good. And so I didn't have to be in the NFL because, again, my whole goal, uh, you know, my thinking was I just want to get get enough to get through law school. And um, but I was on a good football team. We actually won 
we were in the conference, the championship game. We had a championship game each July. So we played March to July, uh, which is actually a great time to play because you don't play in the, the heat. Of, you don't start in the heat of the summer. You end. Um, and so unlike training, our training camps actually were in Florida and Arizona. So we would go to Florida for a month and uh, yeah, we'd go to Deland, Florida, in the, in, uh, between Daytona and Orlando. And we would have our training camps at Stetson University. It was it was awesome uh, because it was still cool. It wasn't hot. And then you'd kind of work your way into the warmer weather and then finish uh, in the hot weather. But you weren't practicing as hard as you would be in, in the NFL as you do in summer. Like they're starting right now for camps. So right, right. we're doing double day sessions. Anyway, I was um, I just had a you know, it was just a great opportunity for me. And um, and so when the league they decided that after the last year they were going to cease operations and they were suing the NFL for antitrust violations. And, um, I knew it was time for me to, to move on. And, uh, I was fortunate because, um, the giants were in need. Uh, most of the guys who they still, the teams were, they weren't discontinued. They didn't go under. They just said they were going to pause. So they were still mm -hmm. under contract. I had only signed a three year contract. So my contract was up. So I was a free agent. And the Giants uh, were in need of a center. And so um, I missed, because they'd already started training camp. I missed about three weeks. Uh, wound up coming in and uh, after I got my contract, because we played all the way into the middle of July. And then um, I played 21, 21 games. And so I needed a couple of weeks off. I was tired. And you and played I, center the whole time, your career. I did. Yeah. Long, that's long, it's no joke, man. Typically, that's, you know, for everybody, by the time you reach the NFL, you've pretty much refined what position you're going to play. There aren't too many crossovers. Uh, does, there are some great athletes that have. but Big many. question for you from a high school football player. I never was that good. Um, I hated playing the line because I'll tell you, on the opposing side, you would get a double fist right up into the – so did you experience that type of stuff in NFL or that's illegal? Oh, that's illegal. We never do that. Okay. Heaven. I mean, that's heaven forbid. Okay. We do something like that. Are you being facetious? Very much. Very much so. Okay. Listen, I it, just had to ask line, the pro level, goes. man. I uh, told Mr. the coach. I, this I really question. sucks. I have a question for you, Mr. Oates. Did the three years at the Philadelphia Stars earn you any goodwill with Philadelphia Eagle fans? No. <laughs> no, not, not at all. No, I, I got booed just as loudly as anybody else, any other Giants. <laughs> Although I got to tell you what, it was a fun experience because while we we didn't, you know, we were in this in the in the uh, it was a veteran stadium at the time, seats about seventy five thousand people. We would have twenty twenty five thousand people, so it was maybe a third full. But I got to tell you what, they made so much noise that was a, just a raucous crowd. Yes. But I knew better. I knew well enough that. For my wife, when I was with the Giants for nine years, you always play a home and home. So we played every year in Philadelphia, the Giants. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just right down the turnpike. It's not far. But I told my wife that was forbidden territory. There was no way that uh, that was that's your target, you know. Well, you I'm from Philly. Here. So for the attorneys today, um, this is a really interesting trivia one. They count on me for this really crazy trivia. But Vet Stadium is the only stadium in the United States history that has an active prison and a judge who's seated on the bench during games to prosecute and handle cases yeah. live on the floor. They, yeah, the so they can expedite those office. cases and uh, get them get them out. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, so, that was we were, yeah, we were well aware of that. I went to Seton Hall, and you, uh, Mr. Oates, uh, were just so mellow about being a student there. And I also remember my favorite story though is Mark Bavaro's wife was was at the school and I was there. Yep, and so I still remember uh, Mark Bavaro picking his wife up uh, the day after he won the Super Bowl. He won it on a Sunday, and then Monday morning, he's Monday afternoon, he's picking his. I just thought, I mean, just what? It was just great. It was it was just very <laughs> impressed by by you and by Mr. Bavaro. Uh, just very nice. Just got a very good vibe about you. Yeah, well, Mark's a great guy, and, and Susie just uh, was. You know, she was a great student and um, did very well. But um, yeah, but Mark, uh, listen, he he had to change diapers just like every you know, it's like everybody else does. It was, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're playing in the NFL, you still have to take care of the family issues. 
Yeah, I just told him he pulled up, and he's like, he looked like a really buff Bruce Springsteen, and so yeah. like Mark Favaro. He I just saw him win the Super Bowl yesterday. <laughs> he said yes. Well, talk to us about the Super Bowl. Uh, I mean, oh, you, which, which one? You, well, you, you, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, you were part of three Super Bowl championship teams. Mm -hmm. Do you still wear the rings? You know, I don't. I don't usually wear them, but I'm a. I'm gonna. Yeah. I actually have them close by. I do. I do have them close by. Happen to. I just. Ooh. I just remembered. So let me. Let me show you my. I quite honestly, I don't know where my 49ers ring is. But, uh -oh. um, but I. I do know my Giants rings, and so just to. Let's see if I can get it. Wow. Wow. So that's one. So there's. There's the inscriptions, right? That's the side. Oh. They have, yeah, I, I never quite understood that. So some people look at it and say, that dates? I go, no, oats. Um, oh, yeah. That's pretty I'm not really, cool. I don't really quite understand why they have to put, because I know my name. I'm pretty good with that. So <laughs> why they had to put my name. Um, and then on this side is, each of them are distinct, right? So there's the uh, wow. score of the game, 39 to 20. There's the uh, Vince Lombardi trophy. It's a George Hallis. And so there's actually, you can't see it, but there's also a score of the, uh, conference championship game that we we beat the uh, Redskins, but that's that's the first one. So it has the the one larger uh, marquee diamond representing the first championship for the organization. Wow! Wow! Um, and then show and tell. I mean, that's what this is. <laughs> so this Ooh, is the yeah. second one. Uh, sees the Giants, and then uh, underneath it says uh, Super World Champion Giants, and then the notice the two larger marquees and uh, there we go it's so that, like that represents the second and then there's the ring of smaller diamonds around them and there's 17 and that was the victories that we had for the year again there was the uh, one of the sides has the the score of the game 20 to 19 against the buffalo bills and the um and again the in case i forget my name <laughs> my name and my, and my right number in. yeah, yeah. Basically, get my name and number. They want to make sure that's down there. Wow! Amazing, amazing. And and Bart, are you still doing the presidency of the NFL Alumni Association? Yeah, I am uh, currently serving as president of the NFL Alumni Association. We're a, a national organization of former players. Uh, we have forty chapters around the country, uh, over five thousand members, and we have uh, primary primary missions of uh, caring caring for kids and caring for our communities. So our chapters will uh, engage uh, in uh, charitable endeavors, uh, children centric as well as first responders uh, to make their communities a better place and use that, use, leverage uh, the notoriety that they have and that we have through the NFL Alumni Association to, to uh, make a positive influence. And then we also um, advocate for players and our second mission is caring for our own, uh, providing health care and, and other uh, solutions that are gonna help players lead more uh, productive and healthy and happy uh, lives after football. And it's interesting, you say alumni, you know, it's 90% of the guys who sign an NFL contract are retired, are out of the game before they hit 30. Wow. So yeah, they're alumni guys way, way, you know, so they're alumni for a long, long time. And so we have a, a wide uh, electric group of younger guys and then obviously older, older guys too, guys like me. Sure. Well, before we, we get to more of what you're doing now, because you're doing very important work, I have to know your favorite moment ever on the field. <laughs> favorite moment ever on the field. Whew. Hard to say. I yeah, I'd say, I'd say out of 14 years of professional football and uh, three, you know, I, we won two championships and you know five different championship games. I'm I'm going to say it's just impossible that I just to say just pick uh, one. Pick one. I would say I, I would. Can, you know, here's what here. How about this? How about this? One of the most memorable plays. Okay. How about that? So one of the most memorable plays I I have is in Super Bowl 25. We're playing the Buffalo Bills. Towards the end of the game, we're moving the ball in the offense. And, and 
while you know we didn't we scored 20 points but we possessed the ball during the game out of 60 minutes we possessed it over 40 minutes it's still an nfl record for time of possession for a super bowl game so we have the ball we move it down the field we get a first down uh on the three yard line on their three yard line and we're down um 19 to 17 so we're down by by two points but we're gonna we're first down we're gonna go in and score a touchdown and go up 24 19. Um, so we run a, a sweep to the right. It's called ride 39. William Roberts, who's the left guard, his responsibility is to pull and lead the play. And I have to reach over and block the onside defensive tackle. And, and all I have to do is just get in his way. And he should, that should be enough is the speed of the play and it will execute properly and they'll be out and, uh, around the corner. Uh, anyway, on the, on the, I, I notice when I'm in my stance and, and, Jeff Hosteller, the quarterback, is going through the cadence that the uh, no, the tackle, who's Jeff Wright, I remember because he, he was also the uh, uh, sit, the nose tackle during the game, but he slides out over to a defensive tackle position, which is just inside the right the guard. And so I, you know, I I got I, I see him kind of slip out. I think he's going to go outside in the B gap between uh, Jumbo Elliott and uh, William Roberts. And so I'm I'm determined. I got to get down there very quick as I decide it. You know, and this is all happening right within just a matter of seconds. Uh, you have three or four seconds to make all these determinations and these uh, decisions. Um, and so I, I go on the snap, I snap, and I go all the way down and cover that gap. But instead of stepping out, he steps in. I go so far, so uh, so fast, so far, he just steps straight up the field. He tackles Otis for a three-yard loss. And we um, then throw two incomplete passes, and we kick a field goal to go up by one point. And so I'm standing there on the side. I remember that play because I'm standing on the sideline. I'm the only person that really knows that because the, the Buffalo Bills get the ball, they go down the field. For Giants fans who remember, they go down the field and um, Scott Norwood misses a 38-yard a field goal mm. to win the game. And it's he only misses it literally by – I mean, it's about a, a yard and a half. And um, – but while he's doing the kick, he's getting ready and setting up, et cetera. I'm the only one that really realizes, you know, the implications of this kick. Because if he makes it, we lose the game. All the media in New York is going to is going to dissect the game and look at that one critical play. Because as it turns out, if Jeff Wright doesn't make that play, Otis Anderson walks in for the touchdown. William Roberts clears it away. Otis walks in for the touchdown. We go up by, by uh, uh, what, five points, four points. We go up by four points, and there's, you know, there's three goals is inconsequential. And so um, I'm the only one knows that if he kicks it, they're gonna go, we would have won the game if Oates makes this block. And, um, and then uh, I know that then the following day I probably – go on waivers and uh, wind up <laughs> sell my house and uh, then wind up on another team, hopefully some the following year. But he missed the kick, and so I didn't have to move. I wound up going to Seton Hall, and, and the rest is history. Sure. Well, the New York, the New York press was tough. <laughs> That's the, the fascinating part that we haven't talked about yet. When we come back from commercial, um, I thought maybe, Tony, if we could, uh, and John, we bring up his raucous party lifestyle when mm. he was – you know, in the off season, of course, he had nothing to do. So that's when the partying begins, the yachting, the boating, the fishing for five days off of uh, the coast and all More the like other studying steps. for law school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think anyone really out there know, <laughs> knows what uh, Bart is actually really doing in the off season. And when we come back, I think they're going to be be pretty surprised to find out. So uh, we will be right back in one second, guys.
Did you know that at least half of the world's population still does not have access to essential health services? One of the biggest problems in developing countries is the lack of medical monitoring devices. We have a solution. Kipuwex. Kipuwex is an easily attachable, lightweight, IOMT device which continuously measures all the clinically relevant biomarkers vital to the assessment of your health. Kipuex uses smart algorithms to provide efficiently reliable measurements for healthcare professionals. The biomarkers can be monitored remotely anywhere and at any time with a mobile and web application. Kipuex is not limited by physical infrastructure and is suitable for professional use and in the future for home users as well. A simple user interface will let you choose which biomarkers you want to view and displays them on easy to read graphs. We here at Kipuex want to combat healthcare inequality and help millions of people around the world. Hey, Chef out here. Want to tell you about my Amazon best-selling memoir cookbook, A Chef is Born, chock full of recipes. Also ranked the 77th book of all time out of 99, according to the Book Authority. It's a good book by the better chef than you. Yeah. It's a good book by a better chef than you, Tony. <laughs> That's not that difficult. I've only mastered the microwave. They they told me when they were visiting here and filming that show in the kitchen studio, they said we were driving in the car, the whole family, they rented a van. The family flew over from San Francisco and <clears throat> the kid said one day, can we pull over? I got to pee like a man. And so <laughs> Otto was like, oh my gosh, we got to pull over. And they went into a rest stop. So. <laughs> Uh, from the mouths of babes, but Bart, yep. I promised when we came back that we were going to reveal um, what you were doing in the off season. So, do you want to tell us a little bit about you know when you were not playing um, and all the parties, yachting and boating and fishing trips, and everything else that you were into? Well, I don't even know that it was the off season because he was doing the two of them at the same time. Uh, my recollection was that he mm -hmm. would be on the field, you know, Sunday and in class Monday. Yep. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I, so we would uh, typically, I would, during the season, I would, <clears throat> I take a writing course or, or maybe a um, Tuesday, Thursday, you know, uh, course or, or Monday, Wednesday. And it was, um, you know, I, I was one that, like I said, I, I didn't expect to play. I, and I, I was, uh, I had an accounting degree. I didn't want to, practice accounting and uh, playing football. I'm like, you know, I can go get a football. I can go get a law degree. And um, I enjoy it. I was kind of a nerdy guy and uh, still am. And so I was, uh, you know, law school was, um, I mean, it was kind of easy for me in some ways. It was either that or get a job during the off season. I didn't want to get a job during the off season. So my wife let me go to school instead of getting a job. Yeah, you were balancing law school and being a professional football player at the same time. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. You know, it's it's um, I don't, because yeah, I take a course during the season. That was just more for just mental stimulation. Football is not an exceptionally mentally stimulating game. I mean, it's, it's repetition and it's recognition. I mean, you know, we'll run the same play hundreds of times, and so it's just this repetition, repetition, repetition. And so I, I took a course during the season just to, just for mental stimulation. Uh, but you know, during the off season when I was playing, if you didn't make the playoffs, you were done before Christmas, uh, before New Year's, and then you didn't um, start football again until the last part of July. So you had seven months pretty much that you had off. And so I was, um, I could I could go to law school and still and still have a month or two where I had downtime. Uh, so it was plus, I mean, it was going to law school. It, was, it wasn't like I was working a full time job. So it was um, I I looked at the folks going to night school. I, you know, you know Seton Hall has a really robust night school program. And those guys, they amazed me. I'm like, you guys are like crazy because they work full time during the day and then they go to school 
four hours a night for four nights a week. Um, so they got to prep for courses. They got to work. I mean, it's just, and you do that for, that was a four year program, not just a, not a three year program. I took mine. It took my, me five years because I, I would take one semester and then take, you know, obviously I didn't matriculate a lot of credits during the fall season, but, um, you know, during, but it took, so it took me a little bit longer, but it was something that I enjoyed. The only thing that happened was I, I, my timing was I figured I'd go to law school and by the time my football career would end, I would uh, be graduating. I'd go right into full-time practice, but uh, um, unfortunately or fortunately, they uh, they still wanted me to play. And so I actually had to go get a job at that point. And so my last five years playing, I worked uh, for a firm in, in, um, in Morristown, New Jersey, Rippus, Graham and Curtin. And I spent uh, my five years there working during the off season. They, they were able to accommodate me. They um, had, they did a lot of personal injury work that you could kind of shelve or hand off to somebody pretty easily. And so that was my first introduction. And actually I actually had to get a job at that point. You know, uh, Mr. Rhodes, the um, Tony's going to know about this. Lawyers have something called pro bono work, which you're assigned to do cases as usually like a, a DWI in some municipality Were you ever yep. signed a, uh, like a DWI in Kearney and you had to go to show up in court, like something like that. I did some pro bono work yet. Yeah. Pre pretty, um, some, you know, some, uh, violations of codes and, uh, of municipal codes, but not a lot, but, uh, you know, because given my status of, uh, being in and out, they weren't sure whether that's going to be available or not. So I played that pretty well. <laughs> you must have some funny stories though, for judges who, you know, would, you're, you're, you know, you, Bart Oates, walks into a courtroom on one side of the case and, you yeah, know, yeah, you know, know, you know, I never, I never tried, I never played. I met, as a matter of fact, I minimized it because I was always of the, like, when I was going to law school, for instance, I was always, you know, I, I figured I was just, just a football player. Everybody else there were, you know, these were like serious students. These were students that, you know, I, I was kind of like, you know, I got to play catch up here. I'm just a football guy. Um, and so I felt a little bit out of my element, uh, because that's, you know, you don't see too many football players going to law school. Um, but so I was, you know, my, my, was always a guy that was afraid that, you know, because, you know, last thing I wanted to, you know, to do is be called upon, um, by a professor and then not be prepared. Um, you know, I just figured I would, I would get a little more attention because I know that, um, on the other side, Bill Parcells was the head coach with the giants. And so he used to, if I made a mistake in practice, he would just, I mean, he would kill me. I mean, he would just stop practice and he'd go, uh, counselor, uh, <laughs> counselor, did, uh, did you, uh, you were not studying, uh, not studying your playbook. Were you studying law books last night? <laughs> Heaven forbid I make a mistake because he would just, Oh, I mean, it's other people. He'd kind of go on. He'd yell at him a little bit. Me, no, no, he'd have to stop practice. So that was your nickname, loved, the, count, I mean, the you counselor. Know. What's that? That was your nickname. Yes, that was his nickname for me. Yeah. That's, that is correct. It, it wasn't a term of endearment, by the way. <laughs> yeah. It that almost wasn't what it was intended is. to be. This is really great stuff. Uh, you are a great person to interview. I'm from Jersey. Um, last week, I just received from the state legislature and the governor the um, Global War on Terrorism Medal. Uh, and uh, I thank you so much. I was in the Navy 30 years. I noticed um, you were chairman of the New Jersey Hall of Fame. And I wonder in your mind, I'm not going to ask you a toughie, like who the maybe the most famous person is from Jersey, but did you have any that you became aware of with the New Jersey Hall of Fame that really... Oh, tons of really yeah. struck you as needing to be mentioned that maybe we don't know so much about? Well, I mean, we have the obvious ones, right? I, I was uh, running it and I have to give a lot of credit to Steve Edwards, who I was actually, it was a sports, New Jersey sports hall of fame. And we converted it over to New Jersey hall of fame that, that includes all walks of lives, uh, which, which was to me was the right thing to do. I was, instead of just highlighting sports folks, um, you know, we, we have such a rich, uh, diversity and um, the the depth of quality with people in different professions and different uh, interest and accomplishments that um, it just between astronauts and actors and entertainers and successful business people and 
you know, um, scientists and uh, doctors and, you know, on and on and on. Right. And so, yeah, I, I mean, we're starstruck a lot of times going there and uh, we've had great, um, some, some great ceremonies where induction ceremonies and um, just really terrific. And uh, the first one is probably the most memorable one. I, you know, I, we had some great ones, but, you know, we had Bruce Springsteen uh, came and performed and gave one of the, I mean, the best acceptance speeches just, it, I mean, he's a poet. The guy is like genuinely wow. this writer. And I remember going um, during that show. It was a long show, and he was the last guy. And um, and I was walking the backstage and went back to a, a this isolated green room. And there he was in the back with four pages of handwritten notes with marks through it. And he was making alterations even right before he went up. Just things that were he really wanted to express, uh, but really kind of express it. You know. This is New Jersey. We're proud, you know, guys, folks from New Jersey, we're proud of it. Whether whether it's somebody that was born and raised here or somebody like me that came at a younger age and, and elected to stay here and, and live here and raise my family here. So um, Absolutely. Uh, a lot of a lot of fun memories and just um, exciting to be part of something where we can recognize uh, those folks that have lived just very um, wonderful and lives that deserve to be uh, highlighted. Yeah. So John Bon Jovi come one night to the White House bar. You know, I was a White House chef and uh, it was the, of course, the Italian American state dinner. Oscar Luigi Scalforo, the president of Italy, was in town and he brought his daughter. And so we were celebrating a, a famous Italian Americans and John's walking in. And of course, all the reporters are there, you know, Connie Chong at the time and Britt Hume and, and what have you. And, and one of them said, uh, aren't you uh, John Bon Jovi would have with a microphone, he said, no, no. He's like, come on, that's your, this is your wife. She's a black belt. She'll kick your ass, don't lie, sir. He was like, I'm not, I'm actually work with the staff here. And they called this afternoon. There's a bunch of open seats. Um, I usually do the lavatories and for us to get in a tuxedo and I had to go rent this for $400 and to come in to fill seats up. They were like, get out of here, you're John Bon Jovi. His wife started laughing and was like, he is, he is, we've been married forever. He's a big practical joker. Yeah. I was like, of all the things to say, <laughs> you're visiting here from Jersey, you know, of all the things to say, he was just, just like really, really quick. Yeah, no, he was, he, and a good guy, just a terrific guy. We've, he is a great so guy. many people like that. They're just, I mean, just genuine, just good people. Just doesn't matter what kind of accolades they've gotten or how famous they are. Ultimately, you sit there and every one of them I've met are just, yes. you know, they're just down to earth good people. Absolutely. Absolutely. So two things, two more things we just want to cover briefly. I'm wondering if you have any opinion on the recent Supreme Court case, the uh, the NCAA versus Alston. Um, I mean, it's done already. The opinion's out there. I didn't know. Time. Uh, yeah. I was wondering if you had like an opinion about it. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think these uh, these young men and young women have a right to um, monetize uh, the things that they do. It's it's you know and it, it's not in it's not in the best interest of the NCA to to regulate that. And I think obviously the you know the courts saw it the same way that you know whatever it was gratuitous at best their justification for trying to control. Uh, what a, an athlete does, uh, whether you know, based upon, even though a lot of that fame comes because of their performances, you know, that was the justification. Um, in spite of that, it's you know, these these athletes have a right to whether it's things that they do and and they leverage that notoriety, then all all the best to them. Uh, is it is going to change the landscape some? Yeah, because you know what was I what was it, the um, what was it, a big booster in Miami. Uh, announced that he was hiring uh, every one of the in a, uh, the football players for uh, tens of thousands of dollars a year for promotional purposes, which is permissible, you know. And so, it's a way to kind of get around some of the rules that they've established. Of you know, you can't pay a guy to play, but here, you know, here's a booster that's already going to pay. He's already guaranteed every player that comes here, you know, ten grand or twenty grand to to to. Mon right to promote his business and um well you know, when the big guys the big guys are gonna listen uh, you know alabama quarterback i think uh saban was talking to a group of coaches um 
and he said, you know, we, we already estimate that the starting quarterback for Alabama is going to get a minimum of a million dollars a year. Uh, wow. So, well, I mean, you, guys short -term. Are, you guys are attorneys and Bart is an expert, but from the cook out here, who's just a blue collar lay person, that's not an expert. Um, the other thing that struck me about that case was they, they mentioned, you know, these coaches are making millions of dollars and the kids get nothing. Uh, set. And sometimes how much do they make Bart? Like, you know, 10, 15 million, a college coach or, Oh, Saban's probably, you know, they're, they're making over 10 million. I think Saban's yeah. somewhere close to that or 8 million. Wow. Yeah. And the kid gets nothing. So, so again, just from the blue collar and I'm, it may not be right or wrong, but the blue collar cook out here, um, you know, that kind of struck me, you know, you know, well, there's just an right. inherent unfairness to it when yeah. and it's not just the coaches, the programs. I mean, some of these programs, University of Texas, Grosses over two hundred million a year through their football wow. program. Wow! I mean, it's it's, and yet you know, here's the player. Yes, they're getting room and board, you know, a, a stipend and free education, but they're bringing what they're bringing to the. It's it's almost like uh, Esau is selling, you know, birthright for a bowl of porridge. You know, it's almost that kind of equation. And they can get in, injured so easily and just have their NFL career gone. They, uh, no, no, not can they do. OK, now they, there's no it's now it's, you know, whether they can continue to play and et cetera. But, um, yeah, it, it's a few guys. It's not a lot of people that, that are going to really reap the, the big the six figures. But then these inventive, you know, some of these kids that, uh, you know, will use it and be inventive and going TikTok or whatever the social media, they they can they can generate a significant uh, following and it creates some some revenues and be entrepreneurial. So this allows them to do that. All the better. Yeah. Well, as soon as your opinion came out, I, I wanted to talk to you about it because I know you have the unique perspective of having both been a player uh, and you're an attorney. So I figured you're in, what better analysis could there be than having you on to. Really? <laughs> yeah. I, I, listen, I, I've always felt that NCA wields a, uh, uh, in disproportionate uh, power, you know, if you will. And that's why the Power Five conferences are in the NCAA is, is not really significant for the football guys. And that's where the that's the biggest amount of money. And so, um, you know, they, they've been able to usurp a lot of those uh, restrictions. It's, you know, we have the national championship games now and, you know, they just generate literally hundreds of millions of dollars. But it's taking that and letting the kids, um, letting them benefit. I mean, yes. To get an edu they have the opportunity to get an education, but that's no justification to say you can't then go on and, and benefit monetarily. And there's just no justification at all. Agreed. So the last thing I want to talk about is your work with the Alumni Association. Uh, if you can tell us a little bit about that or pro things that are coming up, projects that are coming up and and how yeah, people- we, Like I said, we, we have 40 chapters. Our chapters are very busy. They, they do golf tournaments and other events, charitable events. They support um, organized charities in their community that they live in, again, throughout the country. And, um, and so it's, it's, you know, as a national office, we, we provide uh, the, the banking, the regulatory, the compliance so that the chapters don't have to worry about all, any of those types of issues. They can just go out and hold events and uh, we take care of all the, the behind the scenes. And then in addition to that, we also will uh, create relationships and partnerships with, with companies and, and others, as well as creating our own business opportunities that will benefit the former players. And so while we are former players, it's, it's run, it's organized by former players. We also invite anybody that wants to support the mission of the NFL alumni of caring for our community, caring for kids and caring for our own to, to be a part of it. We have, we have a, memberships for businesses. We have memberships for fans, memberships for people that they just want to support the mission. And how do people find out or if they want to be involved, how do they get information? NFLalumni.org. Got it. That, right. Everything's there. You just go on. It says join now and you can go join. Very good. Now you still stay friends. Like you call up Phil Sims when you're, you know, Board one afternoon, are you friends still with the all your players, or have you all gone your separate ways? You know that's one of the um, really pleasurable things about this job is 
is you know, I've, I've always stayed close to teammates um, who I played with and uh, many of them uh, very close to. And, and again, with the alumni and, and being involved in charitable events, um, we come across each other all the time, um, see each other, particularly during the, uh, the golf season, uh, you know, <laughs> the charity golf tournaments and the, that circuit, um, you wind up seeing a lot of the different guys. And then with me as, as a national, I'm, I'm getting phone calls uh, from the, around the country from guys just with questions, with needs, with um, suggestions um, that um, I get to interact with guys all the time. Um, you know, some are Hall of Famers. I talked with Ron Mix today, who's a former uh, Char San Diego Chargers Hall of Famer. And, um, and I've talked to guys that played one or two years. And, um, you know, really for us, it's every member is, has the same. They're the same. We try to – everybody has unique um, issues and concerns and needs. And um, where we can, we, we try to make a difference in their lives. So this is just, it's actually just, it's a wonderful opportunity and it's a lot of fun. Well, they, there was a bunch of lawsuits about concussion cases uh, with the alumni. That's right, yeah. yeah. Well, that got consolidated and it was, it was a class action lawsuit that got settled and NFL agreed initially to a, a billion dollar settlement. Um, they got out cheap, but then the uh, Judge Doty, it's interesting, it's, it's one of these uh, creating you know, you, you have the different the judicial and legislative and executive. So she's actually created the, the ruling and now she's administering um, the ruling uh, from a, a, an executive standpoint. So they have a whole process uh, put together to how people can get an award, uh, who's, who qualifies to receive an award through this, um, through this program. What is interesting is a, within a, a matter of months, um, that billion, about 800 of that billion dollars was committed mm -hmm. already. So they realized so it was either uh, one thing that Judge Doty did uh, do that was um, really good was that she basically made it open ended that whoever qualified to receive payment would get paid. So it's not a, um, so that end result, but it, it is difficult. They've created some hurdles for the players. Uh, we try to help the players understand what those hurdles are and put them in the best help them with the resources that will best help them get a recovery uh, when it's justified. Well, I think you're doing really important work um, and all around and, and especially working with children. Um, you're a role model, obviously. And uh, I think the outreach to kids who need it or to uh, players who need it, I think is such important work. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like they have a, a big event coming up uh, in Florida. Um, next big event, I think, is August 21st. There's a Caring for Kids Golf Classic. I was looking at the website there. Um, yep, TPC there. Sawgrass. That's um, Jacksonville chapter. Uh, Najee Good is our chapter president, a young kid that just he was playing last year for the Colts. Um, came out and um, started working in the organization and just really impressed me as a I love to see these young guys really take charge and take ownership because that's, you know, my, my whole vision is to tr kind of transition this organization to the younger guys and guys in their thirties and forties um, and let them run with this organization. And then some of us older guys can run, we can maintain a presence as a emeritus status. And, um, but it's, it's really about these young guys taking that energy. But that's what uh, this event we're doing. See, we got stuff going on in the uh, Canton during the Super uh, the the induction ceremony. We've got uh, four or five things going on in the Super Bowl that we run. Like I said, our chapters, you can look and say our chapters are, they do, we have literally dozens and dozens of golf events and other events every year, raising millions of dollars for local charities. So we're, we're really proud of that. It's fantastic. It should be. Yeah. So we, we encourage everybody to check out the site. I think we've run it on the screen, uh, but yes. we'll also put it up uh, in the comments uh, when the show comes out on YouTube. And we want to thank Bart Oates for doing Unfortunately, we're out of time today. We hope that you'll come back and keep updating us as new exciting things are happening. Maybe we can, you know, pick your brain and get some more exciting on the field stories too. Sure. Uh, anything we can do for you. If, if there's anything big happening and you need more coverage, please recontact us. We'd awesome. love to we'll do. run it again or have another guy on with you. Or if you say, Hey, you know, this is going to be two, three 
guys need to be on on this one. Uh, we need as many eyeballs on this. Uh, we're always here for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Appreciate the support. Take care. Thank Have you. Have a great week, Bart. Okay. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.